Okay, in this video, what we're going to do is to look at um, the ways in lab that we actually measure pH, okay? And how do we figure out this hydrogen ion concentration and this hydroxide ion concentration? So first thing we want to do is talk about uh, litmus paper. Litmus paper does not tell you the actual pH. All litmus paper can do is tell you if it falls on the acidic side or on the basic side of our range, okay? There's two types of litmus paper. There's red litmus paper and there's blue litmus paper. Well, red litmus paper stays red if it is an acid and it turns blue in a base. Blue litmus paper stays blue in a base but turns red in an acid, okay? And kind of see the graphic over here that kind of shows that, all right? So if you test something with litmus paper, uh, let's say, for example, you have red litmus paper and it turns blue, you know, you got a base. If you have red litmus paper and you dip it in your solution and you get no change, you still have one of two options. It could be neutral or it could be an acid, okay? That's why you wanna use both litmus papers in conjunction with each other, okay? Because if you get no change, you need to be able to determine if you're neutral or not. So using the other color allows you to eliminate this idea of being neutral, all right? So both are used usually in conjunction if you're testing something, okay? Or maybe only one if all you care about is not being acidic or not being basic in terms of what you need to have, okay? Um, now, along the same lines, there's, th there's stuff out there called pH paper, okay? pH paper looks a lot like litmus paper. It um, looks kind of like uh, strips of kind of like filter paper. Um, if you happen to have a pool or a hot tub in your house or if have seen anybody work on that kind of stuff or maybe work at a pool, um, they sometimes use little strips of paper to test the water. It looks similar to that, okay? Um, what makes pH paper better is that it actually will change multiple colors, as you can see on the image over here, depending on the pH. So it'll give you, oh, this is a really, really dark blue. That's a 13. This is a, an orange is a 2. This kind of ugly yellow is a five and so forth. Again, much better because now we're getting relative pHs, but still not super um, accurate because, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say accurate, not super precise because it'll, it'll tell you between two and three, but it won't tell you 2.1, 2.2, or 2.02. So it'll tell you by 10 times increments, right? Because a three to a two, you know, that's 10 times more concentrated. So it's good for getting it narrowed down, but not great if you need a very precise pH um, of your solutions. Now, another whole way of looking at this idea of pH change or pH indication is through actual indicator solutions, all right? And what happens is you actually make up a solution where the chemical in the solution actually is color dependent on the pH or it's color dependent on the hydrogen ions present. So here's a chart of the different ones that, that are pretty common. Thymol blue, for example, okay? It's a pretty good indicator for several different things. If you have a dark blue, you are about 9.2 and above. If you're somewhere in a yellow range, you're somewhere between three and eight. If you are below one, you're pink, okay? So it kind of gives you those ranges. These are really good when you're trying to hit a very specific pH or range. For example, let's say you wanted to run um, a reaction at around you know three or four pH. You could use methyl orange because that's the only place it looks orange. So you actually could, you know, use that to make sure that you stayed in your range. Okay. Of these solutions, the two that I have used the most in my career are phenolphthalein, which is down here. Phenolphthalein is a great indicator, and this is the only one I'm going to make you remember. Okay. Phenolphthalein stays completely clear um, until right around eight, okay? So it's really great for determining as soon as something becomes basic, okay? At the first hint of pink, you know that you have crossed over and you've neutralized it and maybe gone a little bit towards the basic side, okay? So it's a great indicator because of how it goes from clear to pink. Now, once you get from that kind of faint pink to a really dark, dark pink, you, um, you know you've hit that basic range for sure, okay? Um, the other one I've used quite often is bromothymol blue. And bromothymol blue, what's nice about it is you see a pretty obvious color change right at seven. So if you're trying to neutralize something or get it right to seven, um, this is nice because you have a yellow and a blue, and it shows this green range. That green range is actually really hard to hit. Uh, it's much narrower than this, this graphic will probably show you, okay? Now, the reason why we don't use bromothymol blue a lot 
is because bromothymol blue is a slower color changer. So what I mean by that is you do something to it, it takes a little while for the color to, to fade into its next color. So um, there's a time lapse that you have to deal with a little bit. Where phenothaline is almost instantaneous. So um, the things that we're going to be doing in lab when we start using indicators, we're going to use phenothaline um, because it has such a drastic color change and because it turns really close to seven, which is going to be good enough for us. Okay, so these are just your indicator solutions and how they work. My favorite one by name is Congo Red because that's just a cool name. Um, now, of all these indicators, the most precise one is actually a digital tool called a pH meter. Okay, and we'll show you one of these in class. Um, pH meters are able to measure pH down to like one one hundredth of a pH, so like two point five nine or three point eight seven or four or thirteen point two four pH. So these are the tools you want to use if you need a very specific number or you're trying to get that precision, okay? Um, so they're the ones that we want to have. So you might be thinking, well, why, if, we, if, if they're the best ones, why don't we just always use them, okay? Well, they're expensive, okay? Um, and they're electronic, and you need to charge their batteries. And they're kind of finicky, where you have to keep them stored in a buffer solution all their lives if they're not being used. So they're kind of like... You know, they're kind of that fancy stuff that you have in your house, like maybe that fancy china or that fancy uh, um, thing that you have where like, yeah, it's awesome, but it takes a lot to pull it out, right? Um, so you use pH meters when you need the precision, but if you don't need the precision, it's much easier, faster, and cheaper to use pH paper or an indicator solution or those kind of things, okay? So that's kind of why we don't use them all the time. All right. So those are all the ways that we do that. And you'll get a chance in lab to actually to use some of these different tools as we work through our labs. All right. Now, that actually ends the, our module on um, this part of our acid-base chemistry. And we'll leave you from there. Thank you.